Thank you for joining us. You're listening to the Write Project podcast and radio program. This is a show about writing and modern Newfoundland author culture. This program is produced and recorded at CHMR FM 93.5 FM in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador, and is aired on other great stations in the province and elsewhere in the country. It can also be heard online at www.chmr.ca. I'm your host, Matthew LeDrew, author of the Coral Beach Case Files series and founder at Engine Book. Let's see what we have today. We have a very special episode today. We are continuing our look into and getting to know the Writers Alliance of Newfoundland and Labrador, or as they're colloquially known, WANL. This is part of a series where we're interviewing board members, asking them a series of questions, getting their views on things so that writers out there and potential writers out there can get to know who's representing them right now, and hopefully get involved in WANL. All right, well, we are lucky enough to be on the line today with Ainsley Hawthorne. Uh, Ainsley is an author. She has a book coming out soon uh, called The Land of Many Shores, which we're going to talk to her about, which is, I was, so, I was so excited when I met her at the Pitch the Publisher event that Wandel hosted at their uh, AGM last year, because this pitch is incredible and necessary, and I can't wait for her to talk about it. I'm I'm glad she found a publisher. I'm sad it wasn't an engine, but and she found an amazing publisher. But she is also the vice president of the Writers Alliance of Newfoundland and Labrador, and we wanted to talk to her a little bit about that. She is the a new vice president for this new generation of WANL. How are you today, Ainsley? I'm doing great, managing this uh, social isolation, gradually coming out of the funk I started off in, and having little moments of conversation like this really help get through the boredom. Good, good. Yeah, you've had a rough uh, few months because you uh, had, I think you had some kind of medical, uh, like a broken arm or something like that, if I'm not mistaken, and, You're right. and you were here for Snowmageddon. So you couldn't get outside because of your your, your your medical problem, but you also couldn't get outside because of, snow, because of Snowmageddon, and now you're finally healed up, and you also can't leave now because of coronavirus. So you've just become an involuntary hermit. Uh, pretty much. It's been one thing after another, because I broke my wrist January 7th, which was immediately before Snowmageddon, had wrist surgery. I had to have a plate put in. During Snowmageddon, our neighbors had to dig us out so I could go to the hospital, because I was considered an urgent surgery, so it did actually go ahead and then I w- I had already been more or less stuck at home for two months while my wrist was healing I wasn't doing too much out of my home to avoid any potential that I could re-injure it and now here we are once again everyone is stuck at home with me so I do think I'd be handling this slightly better if I hadn't already had two months of uh, involuntary home stay due to the broken wrist before all this started yeah, you are you are halfway to a Howard Hughes. You are just yeah, not <laughs> yeah. Wow, we're don't gonna joke. That's an eerie eerie vision of my future. <laughs> yeah, yeah, long fingernails, peeing in jars in your house, building planes. You know, just a great future to look yeah. flat forward to. Wearing tissue boxes on my feet. Yes, I, know. I feel like when I. When I was a child, I, I I kind of envisioned my adulthood, you know, you sort of imagine what your adulthood will be like. And often when I imagined my own adulthood, it was as like some sort of eccentric hermit or in some sort of like asylum, you know, and when you're seeing on television, it's like fictionalized, horrific, like asylums for people who have mental illness or who are... Um, what would you say, or who are uh, incarcerated against their will because they are uh, doing things that aren't popular with their family or friends. I always somehow thought that would be me. Let's hope it doesn't really work out that way. Yeah, let's hope. That's, yeah, yeah, let's hope. Mm. Um, yeah. So I want to talk to you first about your work with the Writers' Alliance and spend a bit of time with that. I know it's early days and that the work is... Well, it's you guys have been doing amazing stuff, actually. Uh, as of this airing, you've just announced that you guys are doing healthcare and stuff like that. But I wanted to, or, or, or per helping provide healthcare through another organization for authors, which is something that was sorely needed. But I wanted to talk to you just about your your goals and things that you have coming up that you can talk about, and just what you want to see from the Writers Alliance from your tenure there. Well, I let me start by saying, since I'm a fairly new board member, um, I feel that I can say this because I'm not praising myself, I'm praising the work of the prior board members, that having just joined, 
um, the group of directors at Wannell. I'm just very, very impressed by the level of governance and organization that this um, nonprofit has. I've been in the nonprofit sector as a volunteer and an employee for a long time. And let me just tell you, you don't often see the, this level of responsibility and accountability from an organization. So everything is run absolutely um, by the book according to how you obtain agreement from all the board members. There are strategic planning sessions done every single year. Funding is provided by that for the government. That's not coming out of member fees. Um, in order to keep the organization on track, moving forward, fulfilling all the member needs, very few organizations take advantage of that in this province, even though they have the option to because this funding pot is available for it. So as a new member, I'm really impressed by the level of organization that exists there. Um, now, I got involved with the board, um, actually, because I joined Wannell as a member in 2018. And when I went to the 2018 AGM, some questions came up regarding uh, funding, people who want to give donations to the organization and how all that works um, with the Canada Revenue Agency because of the organization status as a nonprofit. Because I've worked in that area before, grants and donations, I was able to answer some of those questions. So I think Kelly, uh, the president at the end of that meeting, came over and said, how would you feel about joining the awards committee where we could really use um, some of that expertise, which I was happy to do. So I was on the awards committee as a member for a year. Oh, and we have you to blame, asked, I understand. Yes, yeah, okay, I don't make any of the decisions. Anyone who's been disappointed, um, we don't make the decisions, we just run the program. And fortunately, the jurors are the ones uh, who make the decisions. But uh, I was on the awards committee for a year, and then at the end of that year, um, I was asked if I wanted to chair the awards committee, which I was happy to do. And normally the chair of the awards committee is also vice president, which is how I came to be vice president. So I will say that our goals moving forward now in this strange new situation are not only to keep existing funding programs running, including, of course, the awards programs, which are all still anticipated to run this year. The NL Book Awards, we're um, running the Fresh Fish Award right now, um, but also to try to the best of the organization's ability to make it responsive to these new circumstances that writers are encountering as a result of COVID-19. So the organization can't have in-person events um, that many people found valuable, like um, the write-ins that were held at different locations uh, around St. John's or readings or some of these events that were previously held, but we're trying to find ways that we can offer online events and offer other services that will benefit the membership during this time. Okay, no, that makes perfect sense. That's And that's wonderful. It's good to hear that things are still chugging along and your, your work's been really important for that. I, I joked, but like the awards committee was really good. Uh, and was really it was really wonderful. I love how inclusive Wannell's been in this generation. Uh, this this podcast reaches a fair number of authors uh, on CHMR and beyond, like all around the country. Uh, and I, I sometimes I make the mistake of assuming it's all genre authors listening, but it's not. But I I gotta say I love how you and this generation of authors you're you're very literary your your writing and your sensibilities. But I love that you were. You don't stick up your nose at any fiction. You know what I mean. Like I've 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 always been of the mind that a writer is a writer is a writer. Like even absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah. And and, and I, I I've like got to say at the board table we talk about this. You know who is a writer, and one of the things that the organization wants to do is recognize the many, many different forms that writing takes. Some of our board members, for instance, work in marketing. And they'll point out that the work that they do, writing copy, um, putting together reports, all of that is also writing work that they are doing every day. And they can benefit from um, programs that are responsive to their needs. So we want to make sure that as an organization, we're recognizing and valuing all the different forms that writing takes in our communities. Yeah, and, and like in a lot of ways, writing as a profession is like uh, a lot of, of other personal things where identity does kind of matter like if you self-identify mm. as a writer that's it you are a writer mm -hmm. that's just oh. kind of the way it is 
Definitely. And the interesting thing about um, identifying as something like a writer is that you don't have to be a professional in order to identify as a writer. You don't need to be published. If writing gives you personal reward, if you like to sit down and journal, if you like to sit down and write poetry just for your own benefit and you never want anyone else to see it, um, you're still a writer and writing has personal value in your own life. I think people can be reticent to use a label like writer on themselves because they feel like they have to achieve some sort of standard, that there's some some bar that they have to um, pass in order to call themselves a writer. But I don't think that's true. I think writer, if you, if writing as an activity is something that brings you reward in whatever form it takes, then you can call yourself a writer. Yeah, no, I, I really agree. Um, and I'm, I've been so happy in this last few generations of the board, like the last few years of it, um, the iterations of it. I remember when I was, this, this is a joke that I feel freely to tell any Wano member that comes on, but when I first got into writing as a serious career, when it wasn't just for my own benefit, I've reached out to a, a well-established uh, self-published author and asked them for advice uh, in an email. We did a bunch back and forth, and I asked him, should I join the Writers' Alliance? And his advice at the time was no. Uh, and his advice was based on, like, if all the programs are geared towards lit fiction, then your dollars will be funding that without you getting mm. anything out of it. And I'm sure. so glad that this, the last few generations of this are kind of recognizing that, that, like, it's not fair to, you know, take money from genre writers and not have any programs that are applicable to them, you know? Yeah, definitely. And the other thing that um, we are thinking about as a board is actually the opposite end because a lot of public, a lot of the programming at an organization like Wannell tends to serve emerging writers, yeah. helping writers to develop and how do you get started. So something we're giving a lot of thought to is how do we also serve the members who are well-established writers and make sure that they're getting opportunities, not just um, employment opportunities because you can through Wannell as an established writer become a mentor to an emerging writer sure. and have some opportunities for paid work which is great for established writers but how can we also potentially provide development opportunities for people who have a book or multiple books published and are at a different stage in their career so um, it's complicated to try to think about serving such a broad membership but uh, it's really rewarding to work with this group of people in the province excellent Excellent. Good. Launching off of, uh, we were talking about, like, identity when it comes to an author, uh, that seems like a good jumping off point to talk about your book, uh, Land of Many Shores, because on some level it does deal with identity in some way, um, or as, as one of its facets, uh, which will become clear when you talk about it. Can you tell me about this book and all about it and what inspired you to do it and anything about it. Definitely. So this this all started because of a pet peeve of mine, which is that I think we tend to talk about Newfoundland identity in a very limited way. Yeah. And I say Newfoundland, even though we're the province of Newfoundland and Labrador intentionally, because I think that's part of how we imagine this identity, that there are Newfoundlanders and Newfoundlanders are, are um, the descendants of people from either Ireland or from England, and we were Catholics and Protestants, and our ancestors were fishermen, and uh, they had their own separate communities. There was some competition between the English Protestants and the Irish Catholics, and we ate jigs dinner and fish and brews, and uh, our heritage is this, you know, wonderful um, Irish music, jigs and reels, and you can find all of this encapsulated in beautiful little commercials showing redheaded girls playing violin on the Newfoundland and Labrador tourism website. Um, because part of this is also how our government sells our province to tourists. Is it's a miniature Ireland. If you come here, that's what our culture really is. And what drives me crazy about that isn't that that isn't really a, a valid and important part of our heritage which it is. It's just that it's not the only part of our heritage. I hear um, multi, right? Multiculturalism, not new to Newfoundland and Labrador. This has been a multicultural part of the world from the very beginning. Before Europeans arrived, there were several different um, indigenous cultures already living here. The Innu, the Inuit, the Mi'kmaq, the Beothic, um, originally before Europeans arrived. Since 
um, settlers have come here. It's not only been English and Irish, we also have very long-standing Lebanese, Portuguese, French populations, Chinese populations. Our Chinese community has been here for hundreds of years. Uh, strong Jewish community. And I just thought all of this rich multiculturalism is part of what makes this place so um, such a wonderful place to live and is part of what contributes to uh, the richness of our culture here and I hate that we ignore it and don't acknowledge it and celebrate it so the original idea for the book was um, to get stories uh, nonfiction, personal stories and perspectives from people who represent communities that we don't normally hear from in this province so um, starting with cultural communities like all of our provinces different indigenous cultures um, and um, long-term settler cultures like Chinese um, descendants of Chinese settlers, descendants of Lebanese settlers. But then um, I also expanded it to people from other backgrounds that we tend not to hear from when we're thinking about um, Newfoundland and Labrador writ large and the people who live here. So people who are two-spirited, transgender, um, LGBTQ+, people who have disabilities or mental illness or addictions and what their life experiences here are like, um, people who work in the sex industry, that's a perspective that we don't hear very often, people who've been incarcerated, and those are individuals that um, many people would like to not even consider as part of those communities, but, you know, people who are incarcerated are members of our communities before, during, and after the time that they're in prison, and we need to you know, incorporate their experiences as much into our society and welcome them into our society um, as much as anyone else. So I um, expect to have 30 contributors in the book. I have, uh, I'm still finding my last few people, but I have 28 people on board, all from different um, backgrounds and experience levels of writing. So for instance, Michelle Butler Hallett is um, contributing, Gemma Hickey is contributing. I have newcomers like Jude Benoit is going to be contributing. Um, people who are primarily poets like Daze Jeffries is uh, contributing a uh, submission. Nikishant Antane, who is Inu, and who's written a book about his nephew, I believe, who walked across uh, Natasanan, which is the traditional territory of the Inu in Labrador, is going to be um, providing a story for the book. So all of these individuals will be providing um, vignettes from their own lives or essays about their perspectives so that we can get a broader idea of what it means to be a Newfoundlander or Labradorian. And I think by doing that, we can really expand our perspective, not only on who we are as a people, but also what we have the potential to become in the future by recognizing the richness of who we are. I think that's a really valuable um, sense of identity and background for us to have moving forward into whatever this province does next. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I fight that fight uh, a little bit on a much uh, less important, let's call it, level. Like, uh, I don't compare what I, as a cis white male, have go through compared to other communities and stuff like that but simple stuff like as a as a genre author even like it, we hear so much that uh well why don't you write newfoundland stuff and i'm like i do mm. like i i hate to tell you i do i am a newfoundlander ergo anything i write is newfoundland fiction it, it just oh, kind i of, couldn't agree more it, it kind of ignores th those kind of thoughts kind of ignore that our culture continued to develop after 1950 like I'm a Newfoundlander who grew up in a very small Newfoundland town. I also grew up with Star Trek The Next Generation, and those two things had equal weight on my young formative fiction years, you know? And there is kind of a, a pigeonholed idea of what is legitimate Newfoundland art in general, not only writing, but also visual arts um, and some other media that they have to, that they have to somehow deal specifically with this Anglo-Irish history of fishing and small communities and what have you in order to be a representation of Newfoundland and Labrador culture. And that's just not recognizing who we really are as a people and how diverse we are as people. Exactly. So that really sounds like a wonderful project. Can I ask what inspired it? 
Yeah, well, so the, the main thing was just looking at the way we conceive of Newfoundland and Labrador and feeling very frustrated by that, having a strong desire to change the narrative. Let's change the narrative from Newfoundland is becoming diverse to Newfoundland has always been diverse and look at the way that diversity exists in our province today and has for hundreds of years. That was my strongest inspiration. Um, I'm not telling any of my own um, stories in the book because I, I'm more interested in getting other people's stories out there. So I'm only planning to write the introduction, but I, I've always had, um, I don't know the right way to say it, mixed feelings about my own identity. You know, I'm a, a white cisgender woman. I'm in a straight marriage, but I'm bisexual. I'm part of the invisible bi population because I'm um, in a monogamous uh, relationship. So you wouldn't necessarily know that I'm bi. We've talked and about so, that, and, how, how um, bi erasure can be so problematic. Well, it is, and it's hard to know how to talk about it when you're someone like me. Because on the one hand, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to assume too strongly an identity I've never had to pay the price for, because due to the fact that I pass as a straight person, so I'm in a straight relationship, I don't get hassled the way people who are in relationships with members of the opposite sex get hassled, literally on the street, just trying to live their daily lives. Um, but at the same time, I do think it's important to say, just as a reminder, that bi people exist um, and we have lots of different relationships that look, you know, like different things. Some bi people are poly and they date um, people of different genders at the same time. Some bi people are monogamous and they wind up in a long term relationship with people of the opposite sex or people of the same sex. Um, but we exist. We are out here. We are part of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and also, I, I would like to make people more aware of this um, cultural diversity because my own family background is culturally diverse, um, primarily Irish and English with Scottish that is from my mother's side in Cape Breton. My mom's originally from Cape Breton. Um, but back in the family history is also French and Mi'kmaq ancestry. And that's a small part of my ancestry. I'm not um, an Indigenous person who was raised in Indigenous culture. But like many people, I feel like my family tree reflects some of that multiculturalism that we have in this province that we don't often recognize, um, but that more people are becoming aware of because uh, once the Halibut Band on the West Coast was founded, the Halibut Mi'kmaq Band, no one was prepared for the huge number of people who would apply to that because they have Indigenous ancestry. Now, um, separating that from the question of Indigenous identity and the federal government you know, making these decisions about who does and doesn't qualify and benefits and this type of thing. That is just interesting in and of itself that 100,000 people in this province, that's one, that's 20% of our province's population, have Indigenous ancestry. Yeah, We've never told that as part of our story before. And that's just Mi'kmaq ancestry in one particular part of the province. We just don't tell that as part of the story of, of who we are as people. So I, I just think that all of that is so valuable and important for us to capture um, as a way to reimagine what Newfoundland and Labrador is all about. Yeah, I agree. I, I think there's this book that I love. I love what you're doing. I got I to gotta say that. I'm really looking forward Thank to that you so book. Much. And if there's anything I can do on this show or in my other life to help promote it, let me know. Because it, it seems very important and it's very up my alley. We've talked about this before at the Pitch the Publisher yeah. thing. Uh, and I thank love ethnography. You because you've been so supportive from the start, which I really, really appreciate. No, it's it sounds like an amazing uh, project. So I, uh, my background, I went to school. I minored in anthropology, um, and I really love ethnographies and reading about other cultures and stuff like that. There's this one book I think we talked about it before, but if not, I just wanted to, to put it out there that I loved called um, Why Nations Fail. Um, oh, okay. I've heard of it. I haven't read it. Yeah. I, uh, I wrote about it in the uh, the latest issue of Word. Um, mm. But it's uh, it's basically about, it's, it's anthropologists theorizing, like, every nation that's failed, what went wrong. And the one commonality, because there's always, like, economic stuff and stuff like that, but the one commonality that's true of everyone, every nation that's failed, is that at some point, their culture became stagnant, and they started to become afraid of new cultural elements. 
And mm. I'm really afraid of Newfoundland that we've done that, that we've bubbled like the definition of what is Newfoundland culture into this pre 1950s bubble. And that anyone who wants anything different from that is forced to move away. Mm-hmm. And because they're not considered an air quote part of the Newfoundland experience, end quote. And as a result, we're driving away anything new and we're just suffocating in this bubble. Like there's only so much oxygen in a bubble when you do that. And and I think your book is gonna be very important. Uh, for being a part of the process that makes that not happen. Like, if we can kick open that door and stop that from happening, your book is going to be one of the books that do that, and I'm very excited about it. Thank you so much. And I just want to add to that point, because I think it's really important that I think what's happening in those scenarios when people are looking more to the past um, to define themselves and culture begins to stagnate is that a society begins to treat itself like a dead culture. Yeah. So now we're just preserving something that used to exist and we don't see ourselves as a living culture. We don't recognize what's happening today as what our culture fundamentally is. We're defining ourselves according to some lost past. And um, the story that, and I see this in lots of different things that I do because I'm also a folk dancer and and often folk dance, You when you try to pin folk dance down, you also kind of kill it because by making it something static, like we're going to boil this down to a series of steps that we can teach to people in different parts of the world and put on stage in a specific set of costumes, and we'll say that's such and such folk dance. What you do is you pin it like a butterfly, and you um, either ignore the developments that continue to go on with that dance in the culture that it comes from, or you accidentally stop the development of that dance and the culture because people start to look at what goes on stage as their folk dance and they say, oh, well, I guess we shouldn't be changing what we're all doing at home at parties. We should probably be sticking to what they say is official folk dance. And it, it sort of kills the thing that it's trying to capture instead of allowing it to continue to develop and be a living, breathing part of the culture. So we definitely want to continue to allow um all of the the different cultures within our province to continue to be living, breathing, modern cultures. So I did a dance class with uh, Possessum Paul, who is, uh, I think, Abenagi um, from New Brunswick, who came here to teach some powwow dancing styles prior to the annual Mawiomi that's held on Indigenous Peoples Day here in the capital city. He is like a fabulous dance teacher, But one of the things he said is he was talking about his regalia for dancing and he sometimes he says he'll use like a a CD or a DVD on the top of his headpiece to be reflective because it has that nice like rainbow reflection and it looks great with the beadwork. And people have said to him, well, that's not, you know, that's not traditional. That's not traditionally what would be used in the culture. And he says, but my culture is a modern culture. These objects are part of my life experience and my culture is a living modern breathing culture and i just thought that is so important because people tend to treat indigenous cultures like there's something from the past yeah. when really no they're modern breathing living today people dancing speaking you know cooking living their lives right so so important to think of culture as living and allow it to continue to develop and cultural diffusion happens which is different from appropriation cultural diffusion is when like a culture naturally and healthily adopts uh, aspects from other cultures, like upcycling a CD to use as part of their dress or whatever like that. Right. Yeah. Right, absolutely. And there are those conversations, especially when we're all living in the same area and we're we're really, you know, subcultures are members of a big cultural tapestry. So we do share things with each other and that's natural. That's part of how we all move forward. As long as it isn't exploitative, that's when it becomes cultural appropriation. Yeah. And sometimes it's hard to find that line and sometimes it's super easy to find that line. And I'm yes. I'm usually <laughs> as someone who has a background in anthropology, I'm usually the one who ends up arguing that like, no no, that's actually cultural diffusion and it's fine. And then I end up sounding like someone who I would usually disagree with. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm like... Yeah, there is. Like, oh. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you very much, Ainsley Hawthorne, for coming on. I am so looking forward to your book, The Land of Many Shores, and I am very much looking forward to everything you're going to accomplish on the Writers Alliance of Newfoundland Labrador board as its vice president. And I hope that someday I can serve on such a board with you because this is... 
just amazing everything that you were doing. Uh, please, everyone, keep an eye out for your work. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on today. And we would love to have you. So please uh, keep an eye out if there are board positions in the future. We'll scoop you up. All right. Well, thanks for coming on again. For all of you, we'll be here again next week at 4.30 Newfoundland time or online at chmr.ca. Please tune in and we'll talk more about writing culture in Newfoundland.